The ancient Greeks deduced that in the southern hemisphere there must be enormous unexplored land masses, a mysterious place full of gold with an ideal climate and docile natives. Spanish and Portuguese explorers searched in vain for this lost continent, which by this time everyone was calling Terra Australis Incognita. When the first white colonists arrived here, they found a completely different world from the one they'd imagined, covered in an impenetrable jungle and inhabited by strange creatures. A land forgotten by time, a world which had been left behind, lost in the mists of evolution, retaining much of the original life of the long since vanished supercontinent, Gondwana. Nothing was familiar to them, but no one doubted that this was a land of natural splendors an explosion of life from the depths of time. This is the story of a land caught in its own bubble, which was suddenly invaded by outsiders. It is the story of the last creatures of independent evolution, the only modern descendants of those who lost in the strange game of evolution. Two of these were to suffer different but similar fates. Both were to become living or extinct legends. We are going to an island where no one is safe. Tasmania is an island which lies to the south of the Australian continent, from which it became definitively separated around 13 million years ago. This isolation occurred after thousands of years of shared evolution, meaning that Tasmania has to this day conserved relics of the primeval universal forest, which once stretched right around the world some 250 million years ago. At that time, all dry land in the southern hemisphere formed an enormous compact mass, the supercontinent called Gondwana. The proof of this can be found along the coasts which, ripped apart from each other, still preserve common geological features. Gondwana included the present lands of Australia, the Antarctic, Africa, South America, and India. The breakup of the supercontinent brought great changes. Titanic forces created new seas, moving continents and cooling the climate. Australia, along with Tasmania, drifted to east of the Antarctic. The scars of the Great Wound healed and hardened to form fossils of the creatures that lived at that time and which can today be found in all the pieces of this immense jigsaw puzzle. Despite the enormous distances now, the edges reveal that these coasts and those of South America are parts of the same mass. But not all evidence of the existence of Gondwana is so static. The so-called sea lions and elephant seals belong to the same family, but despite the name, they are not seals at all. Here in Tasmania, 
There are huge colonies along the rocky coast, right along the line of the split from Gondwana. The harems of females are protected by large, powerful males, always on the lookout for invaders. The sea lions and elephant seals, in contrast to true seals, have small visible ears at the sides of their huge heads. And they can move upright on land with relative ease, thanks to their limbs, which are much more functional than those of their cousins. On craggy land, an elephant seal can move faster than a man. When they are not busy sunbathing or fighting, the elephant seals swim, which they can do very well. They row with simultaneous movements of their hands as if flying and hardly using the rear fins as a seal would. They dive down into the water, normally remaining submerged for around five minutes looking for squid, octopus and fish. The interesting thing about these Australian seals is that we can also find them much further away, 5,000 kilometers from here across the Antarctic on the frozen coasts of Tierra del Fuego in South America. This is the other edge of the former Gondwana, and despite the distance, the scene is almost the same. These fur seals and sea lions are physically and socially identical to their brothers in Tasmania. But the similarities don't stop there. When the supercontinent had begun to break apart, Australia, South America and the Antarctic remained connected for some time longer, also sharing the ancient leaf forests of Gondwana. The final refuge of these austral beech trees are precisely in Tierra del Fuego and in Tasmania. These forests of Notophagus are the legacy of the dead heart of Gondwana, the surviving vegetation of a primeval landscape. Australia then became an isolated continent. A terra incognita australis largely turned to desert thus starting down the path of separate evolution, and below it, the small island of Tasmania, the Green Island. Tasmania is an island covered in dense rainforest where, among the abrupt rises and falls of the landscape, hide creatures which, in the majority of cases, exist nowhere else on the planet. A zoological paradise with numerous national parks, three of which are considered World Heritage Sites. The first colonists to arrive in these lands were amazed at the strange appearance of all the animals. 
Even the swans were black, rather than the white ones they were used to hunting back in Europe. There is a large population of black swans in continental Australia, Tasmania and New Zealand, where they were introduced by man. Weighing almost nine kilos and with a wingspan of nearly two meters, this male leaves us in no doubt that this is his territory. Everywhere, the strange creatures like the Cape Barren Goose were evidence that this world is quite unlike anything they had seen before. Each type of forest, each branch has its specialists who have evolved to best exploit the resources of the island. Isolation has made it possible to develop exclusive designs adapted to particular ecological niches. The white cockatoo eats fruits, while the black yellowtail cockatoo devours insect larvae, taking the place of the woodpeckers, which don't exist here. Now he's feeding his almost fully grown chick. <coughs> Apart from the bright colors, some birds look very familiar. However, in the interior of the rainforests hide others of less conventional appearance. The giant nightjar or frogmouth spends its day imitating a broken branch. And that's discreet if we compare it with the flaming colors of the cockatoos. But the real evolutionary winners on this island are a family of mammals which came to Australia from the forests of Gondwana. Free from the predators of the outside world, the marsupials like these grey kangaroos were able to diversify here in Australia. Almost all their close relatives who remained in America were devoured by the powerful enemies who invaded from the north. Here in safety, the marsupials have been able to conserve their own particular means of reproduction, a short gestation and protective pouches in which they hide their young. Mothers with balconies whose children do not want to leave home. Australia and Tasmania are now home to so many types of marsupial that they have adapted to all environments and all the levels of the ecological pyramid. Here, marsupials occupy all those places where, in the rest of the world, we would find mammals with placentas. This is proof that similar conditions and needs created morphologically similar forms, evolutionary convergence. Without this, the kangaroos would be the equivalent of the deer in the Northern Hemisphere. These many thousands of years of separate evolution gave this animal a different role from that of our badgers. This is the wombat. Chubby and cute looking, the wombat also has its marsupial's pouch, though with the opening at the back, so it doesn't get full of soil when it digs. 
The first reports of them were brought back following a shipwreck, and they were described as a kind of wild pig. On the long rainy days, the first Europeans told and exaggerated these stories by the light of the fires in their cabins. And when night fell in the southern hemisphere, the ancestral imported fears of the colonists resurfaced. Ghosts and goblins found here the perfect atmosphere in which to emerge from the mist. Superior darkness is full of shadows playing the hide and seek of death, whether they want to or not. I spy, I spy, what do you spy? A ring tailed possum. A vegetarian that tries to remain unnoticed. For those men, animals like these were hardly appetizing from a gastronomic point of view, but they soon came to appreciate their furs and hunted and killed vast numbers of them. Despite this, these old elves of Gondwana have been able to survive Small in size, they only come out at night in search of fruits or flowers among the branches, the same branches whose shadows they fear. And their fear is justified. Some of their marsupial relatives eat meat and have evolved into efficient predators ready to pounce on any unwary creature. He must be constantly listening out his defense is to remain very still. Others, however, have a rather more active way. The little Tasmanian bitong, a jumper and the forest-dwelling relative of the big kangaroos, has stopped searching for mushrooms and insects because he doesn't like our game. I spy. What do you spy? Eastern quoll, one of the native cat species specialized in hunting invertebrates and small prey on the forest floor. He has adapted well to the pasture created by man, even becoming man's friend as he devours large quantities of insects. He is not an enemy of the beetong or the possum when they are adults, but he would not hesitate to attack a young bandicoot. And 
there he's found one. The family of the bandicoot say absolutely everything. They are marsupials, but their small legs are like those of the herbivores and their teeth are like carnivores. So their body is rather like a unique combination of different evolutionary traits. But just being 40 centimeters long, a bandicoot never knows when he's eating his last meal. The giant quoll is out on the prowl, so it'd be better to make a run for it. The giant or spotted tail quoll is a killer of four kilos in weight, extremely intelligent and skilled at hunting among the upper branches. This is the marsupial version of the European pine marten. As his life is closely linked to the shrinking forest, his future is uncertain. And to make matters worse, domestic cats and foxes introduced by man are rivals for the same kind of food. Nonetheless, for as long as he survives, no bird or possum is safe when the giant quoll is out looking for victims. After some of the worst nights they experienced in Tasmania, the first white men to explore the island created a legend around the terrible grunts they could hear piercing through the fog. Only a devil could make those noises. The Tasmanian devil. This devil is, in fact, the largest carnivorous marsupial in Australia, but he doesn't deserve his bad reputation. In reality, it is a shy, not particularly efficient predator more likely to scavenge than hunt anything down. The only true diabolic thing about it is its smell, a disgusting stink which, without a doubt, helped it earn its name. When those sailors realized that they had been terrified of nothing more than this innocent creature, they felt they had to invent incredible exaggerated horror stories so as not to look foolish. And obviously, the more the stories were retold, the bigger the devil became, a ferocious beast with sharp fangs. So when people came face to face with one, they believed they had found the devil's infant, 
whose fearsome mother lay in hiding in the jungle. This grumpy little thing, so little resembling its name, paid dearly for the boasting tales of his English discoverers, and he hid deep in the forest. This is the only place it is now possible to find him. The Tasmanian devils are not very sociable creatures. They prowl around alone, generally in search of carrion, guided by their excellent sense of smell. They rarely kill, but when they do, their usual victims are wombats and wallabies. Compact and vigorous, their ability to adapt to eat different foods explains why they have survived reasonably well. Despite the colonization of their territories, unlike what has happened to their relative, the Tasmanian tiger. They are good, skilled climbers, swimmers and divers, despite their very unathletic appearance. However, from time to time, their numbers suddenly and dramatically fall, before again slowly recovering. The cause of this phenomenon is unknown but it also appears to occur quite often with other marsupial species. This little devil, one meter in length and weighing just eight kilos, nonetheless produces gigantic sperm. The young have a very hard road ahead of them before they reach adulthood, and many of them die early on in their lives. But at least they have managed to survive, alive and as grumpy as ever. The devils disappeared from continental Australia and have only survived by seeking refuge in the forests of Tasmania. But another much bigger marsupial killer was not so lucky. The only place it can be found is in books on the zoology and the jungles of this island. The last one was hunted and killed in 1930 and since then there has been no trace of them. 52 years later in 1982, a warden from the Tasmanian Park Service claimed to have seen one from his car in a place which has been kept secret. Many expeditions have passed by these waterfalls in their search of this animal, but with no luck. There is even an area of 650,000 hectares set aside as a reserve for them, if any have survived. A fascinating animal weighing up to 35 kilos, which due to the parallel evolution of the marsupials, came to resemble the wolves of the northern hemisphere, both in appearance and behavior, though the two species are not related. The answer lies behind these large leaves. Tracks and excrement which provide no clear evidence, sightings that could not be scientifically verified. Does the great marsupial predator still exist? We are talking of the thylacine, also known as the marsupial wolf or the Tasmanian tiger, a solitary hunter of kangaroos which stubbornly pursued its prey to exhaustion and certain death. The Tasmanian tiger was hunted and massacred by the Europeans because it reminded them of the wolf, which they also almost wiped out in their own continent. As always, the white men in their murderous obsession came with their shotguns to shoot this wolf-like animal, 
or any other they found. It all began in 1803 with the arrival of the first wave of settlers to this region. For the majority of them, Australia was a second-class world which they had a perfect right to mercilessly exploit in order to get rich as quickly as possible and then return home. Jeff King is the third generation of those who stayed and are still here. His forefathers cut down the forests, established farms, and perhaps worst of all, brought with them their domestic animals, so different from the native species. Mammals, some of them aggressive, some of them simply not adapted to these lands. The Australian marsupials, which had evolved in isolation for over 50 million years, were helpless against this invasion of cows, sheep, pigs, horses, goats, and dogs. Conflict was inevitable. Very soon, the farmers accused the Tasmanian tigers of killing their cows, which in fact were the victims of disease, and the dogs now run wild. The accusations spread, and very quickly, everyone knew who was to blame for anything bad that happened on the farm. The enormous jaws of the marsupial wolf, which thus became a legitimate target for their rifles. War began. The hunters killed Tasmanian tigers and had their photos taken standing over their bodies, while at their sides sat the real culprit. No one seemed to realize that a unique species was simply disappearing, a species which science had not even had a chance to study. Tasmanian tiger fur became fashionable in London for gentlemen's waistcoats, while the last survivors of the predators of Gondwana rotted and died in cages and zoos, where, given their nocturnal habits, no one was even interested in them. One of the many wonders of evolution was condemned without trial to extinction. But the arrival of the white man was not the only reason for the death of the Tasmanian tigers. 50,000 years earlier, the ancestors of the Australian Aborigines had arrived from Asia. Over many generations, they slowly spread south. Their paintings speak of a deep affinity with the creatures of the earth, an awareness of their place among them. The Aborigines hunted the Tasmanian tigers as they did many other animals, but maintaining a natural balance, never threatening to exterminate them. They used fire to clear the undergrowth and make hunting easier, and in this way they changed the landscape of Australia. The flames of the Aborigines were their tribal temple, their spiritual centre. They generally lived in harmony with their surroundings, but they made the same mistake as the white man made many years later. They brought their companions with them. The dogs brought by the Aborigines soon turned wild, leaving their masters to go hunting alone, and competed with the Tasmanian tigers for the same prey.
Yet again, perhaps the real disaster for the marsupial wolf came 3,000 years ago with the appearance of its worst enemy, the dingo. No one knows how they arrived in Australia, but they are true canines descended from the Asian wolf. Their strength lies in their numbers as they hunt in packs and give birth to large litters of pups. The Tasmanian tigers, solitary and less prolific, suffered not only from the competition for these same resources, but were also themselves hunted by hordes of these newly arrived yellow dogs. Since then, the dingoes have been the largest land carnivores in Australia, attacking large animals such as kangaroos, as well as wombats and even lizards and smaller prey. When the first sheep were brought to Australia, the dingoes were here ready to attack. And of course, this slaughter was also blamed on the Tasmanian tigers, one more supposed crime to add to what was already a long list. The dingoes are still a problem today, so much so that the largest fence in the world has been built to keep them away from the sheep, 3,307 miles of barbed wire. The great strength of the dingo is the same as that of all wild canines, their ability to adapt to almost anything. The large packs can quickly disperse when necessary, and then they become solitary hunters, like this one. No protein is wasted, and when a dingo finds a dead body, he simply eats it like any other scavenger. In a land where every man had a rifle, like Australia at the time of the first colonists, this was a very useful way of adapting to the resources made unexpectedly available. Apparently, the Tasmanian tigers not only were not scavengers, but what is more, they ate only part of the animals they themselves had hunted, leaving the rest behind. But what with the wild dogs, the farmers and the dingoes, the only place a Tasmanian tiger would have been safe is here behind glass in the museum. At least we still have these old pictures of the last survivors in captivity. A great loss to zoology. When this specimen died in 1936, the Tasmanian government finally decided to declare it a protected species. But this was the last one. The Tasmanian tiger was protected and exterminated on one and the same day. Since then, the zoologists from all around the world have tried to find a living example in the isolated jungles of western Tasmania. People claim to have identified the marks of their enormous jaws on the heads of dead sheep, but they remain, for the moment, merely a legend. So many changes, so many invasions of the land of the marsupials had disastrous consequences, as we have seen. Nonetheless, the disappearance of forest areas to make way for open field, the increased diversification of pasture with the introduction of new types of grass, 
and the creation of watering holes for the cattle have led to increases in the population of some animals, such as the wallabies and the kangaroos. Inevitably, with so many kangaroos around eating the grass, the farmers soon got angry and went to get their shotguns. Outside the wildlife reserves, the majority of kangaroos live on private land, where despite legal protection, it is very difficult to prevent poaching. Many are now asking why the farmers should kill the kangaroos in order to breed sheep, which simply add to the world's surpluses of wool and meat when surely the profitable thing to do would be to simply breed kangaroos. They may look adorable, and they are, but for a farmer they are simply giant rats. There are too many of them, and they eat the grass intended for the cattle. and the shotgun is not the only way to kill them. Modern Australia presents a different threat to the children of Gondwana. Vast plains, straight roads, and excessive speeds. The black night, the sudden dazzle of headlamps, and the result is there for you to see. More bodies to feed the scavengers. Tasmania is today the last refuge of ancient wildlife in Australia. As it is an island, the dingoes were never able to reach here, and because it is mountainous, much of the land was of no interest to the farmers. In the depths of the jungles, you can still hear the growls of the devil that terrified the first colonists. The Tasmanian devils, along with many other animals who sought refuge here, survive in the thick, humid vegetation hidden in the dark of the night. They managed to escape the almost certainly tragic fate of the Tasmanian tiger thanks to a number of factors. First of all, humans do not want their fur because of its terrible smell. The fur industry chose rather to persecute the possums, like this ring-tailed individual. Their meat, of course, was almost immediately rejected for the same reasons, though it was considered good enough for the convicts. And moreover, what the white man produced in perhaps greater quantity than anything else, dead bodies, was precisely what the devils liked to eat. First the Tasmanian tigers, then the dingoes, now the kangaroos and wallabies, an endless menu which modern Australia served up to them, thereby helping them to avoid following the impressive Tasmanian tiger into extinction. His incredibly developed sense of smell has led this male here. But the body has already been found by another devil who tries to hide it from his competitor. 
When the Tasmanian devils gather round a dead body, everyone in the jungle knows what is about to happen. They immediately begin their famous growls. Very soon, other devils approach from kilometers around, attracted by so much noise, and then join in the feast. So they have to eat quickly. The din, the grotesque noises heard from a distance in the dense jungle, literally made the hairs of those first colonists stand on end. They locked themselves inside their houses, petrified, imagining horrific scenes and enormous monsters. The phenomenon exists for a good reason. The dissuasive effect of these grunts protected relatively small animals like the devils from attack by other larger predators such as the Tasmanian tigers. It's an almost perfect bluff. The strategy is to intimidate, and as they are still with us, it obviously works. If you've got a hungry stomach, this land is the right place to be. Weighing almost 12 kilograms, an adult male is capable of eating up to a quarter of his weight at a single sitting. They devour even the bones thanks to their powerful jaws, which can even crack a sheep skull. No one ever claimed they were good-natured when it comes to eating. The fact is, Tasmania is still the house of the devil. Now, almost in the 21st century, a number of biologists are still searching for the Tasmanian tiger in the jungles of this mysterious island. Every year, someone claims to have caught a fleeting glimpse of one, but no one has yet been able to provide convincing evidence. Many questions could be answered if a living survivor was found perhaps unknown physiological data which would help us to better understand our own organism. Or perhaps simply we would enjoy the pleasure of being reunited with an old friend we thought lost forever. Some of the strange appearances of unidentified animals, which could be Tasmanian tigers, have been filmed and sent to specialists who watch them closely over and over again trying to make out some unequivocal feature of the anatomy of the marsupial. It's possible that they're still out there, somewhere. And perhaps it would be better if they were never found. They are probably safer remaining a legend rather than coming back to life, but Tasmania misses them. The ancient misty island which so many sailors sailed past without seeing still contains hidden corners which have never been visited. Complex labyrinths among the mountains provide hope that one will be found alive. But the natural habitat of the marsupial wolves is not the jungle. They would have come here only a force to and if any did survive, it is possible they would not live long in these unfamiliar surroundings. The secret remains hidden on this island of timid devils and ghost tigers, the final refuge of the spirit of Gondwana. <laughs>